Hey, this is the four segments of evolution fourth. I hope this is the last one here. Uh, this is just continuing the selective breeding or selective evolution. Uh, humans can really change things around. Like here, you can see all the different kind of dogs originally coming from the wolf. And uh, so we are capable of changing a whole lot of things. And the next uh, thing we have to talk about is the macro evolution. And this is, as you know, the large scale evolutionary change, which is involving the formation of new species. And these are the steps we can have the, we, we have to talk about extinction, adaptive mm -hmm. radiation, the convergent evolution, coevolution, gradualism, and the changes in the uh, uh, developmental genes. So let's start with the mass extinction. This is kind of important because um, there is a whole lot of uh, mass extinction during the Earth history. Uh, basically, mass extinction is an event when a lot of species are uh, extinct at the same time. Um, these are periods when huge amount of species disappear. Basically, whole ecosystems can be wiped out. Uh, which left, uh, leaves a lot of life habitats and ecosystems open, which usually result in a burst of evolution. Uh, so these new species coming around and filling in those uh, habitats. Uh, this, these things can really disrupt the energy flow throughout the biosphere and, and can cause a lot of food web to collapse. But also, it opens the doors for evolution to be really, really fast. Usually when, when mass extinction happens, the evolution really speeds up because you have all those empty ecologic niches and so it's, it's really cool. It's like, it's like the gold rush when people, people learned that there was gold in California, it was a sparse located area, but in like two weeks or, or more, everybody was over there. Uh, so towns were building like in, in that's the same thing with, uh, with the evolution after mass extinction. Uh, the next slide just shows the number of mass extinctions in the, during the earth history. So down here is, as you can see from the Precambrian all the way to today. And this is the percentage of families being extinct. Uh, mm -hmm. so you can see one of the biggest one was the end of the Permian extinction here. And there was one like right at the beginning of the Cambrian. End of Triassic is a pretty big one right here. And you can see the Jurassic wasn't really, the Jurassic is when, uh, I'm sorry, the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs died out right here. Uh, and it wasn't such a big deal really compared to the end of the Permian. You know, that was the, the, when Pangea was formed exactly, so that was one of the worst one, really. Uh, the next one is the adaptive uh, radiation, and that just means that you have an ancestral species and something happens with the environment, like uh, continents break up or something. So this original species get away from each other, they really have to adapt to different environments, so therefore they will actually radially change, you know, depend on where those species get, they will have to become different uh, in their mostly eating habits or being different so the predators don't get you and that kind of thing. So at the end, they wouldn't be able to, to uh, interbreed with the original species. So this is a branching out of population through variations. And uh, the new species will live very different than the original did. So that's what we call adaptive radiation. And uh, basically this is the finches of the Galapagos Island. This is what Darwin, Charles Darwin could actually um, describe and observe. So this is really cool. The next one is the convergent evolution. And the convergent evolution is the type of evolution when you have two absolutely different um, continent let's say but the ecologic niches like the the environments are very similar so therefore even though the evolution could be at different level the the uh, species will form to be very very similar because they fill up uh 
living spaces which have very similar environmental conditions. So therefore, whoever lives there has to be very similar. Like this here shows you the, the marsupials and the placental mammals in Australia versus um, Europe and America. And um, another example for this is the, the penguin limbs, the whale flipper and the fish fin. So they had to uh, be very similar because um, because they have to do the same kind of thing. So that's convergent evolution. The next one is the co-evolution. And the co-evolution basically is when the you have a mutual evolutionary influence between two species like Nemo, you know, the, the clownfish and the sea anemone. They live together. They cannot be without each other. So they, they influence, influence each other's evolution, just like the Koras live with the algae together so therefore they define each other's evolution somehow so each party exerts selective pressure on the other thereby affecting each other's evolution and the next one is the gradualism and that is the evolution of new species by gradual accumulation of small genetic changes over long periods of time and the opposite of the gradualism is the punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is when you have stable periods with no changes and then sudden changes. Um, and this just shows the gradualism right here. This is the gradual changes and this is the um, punctuated equilibrium. And I have this slide which also shows the same thing. This is the gradualism. And this is the um, punctuated equilibrium. Basically, the the uh, Stephen Gould come up with the punctuated equilibrium because uh, the because of the missing transitional forms where the gradualism would require that because it's gradually changing. We do have a whole lot of uh, example for this. The the changes slowly with transitional forms. But then there are species which change suddenly to something different. So that's why he said that there is possibility for that there is no change. And then boom, suddenly something happens. So the species have to change or die. So therefore they suddenly will change. But the thing is that we must know that the deposition is not continuous. Remember we, we talked about the different unconformities. So therefore the lack of transitional form is not really uh, necessarily mean anything. It could just be the artifact of the fossil record. And this couple of slides just shows a bunch of transitional form, like right here. And uh, there is the other one, the archeo Archaeopteryx, which has dinosaur-like features and bird-like features. Uh, and then the fish to amphibian transitional forms. And of course, I already kind of showed you the horse. The, the horse development, horse evolution has very, very many transitional forms. So it's not something which we don't have. It's just not everybody has. Every uh, evolution uh, has um, transitional forms uh, preserved and formed so far. The last one is the changes in the developmental genes and body plants, which is really, really interesting. Um, it could be that um, during the embryo, you know, the um, during the embryo, em embryonic development, I couldn't say this word for some stupid reason. Uh, so during the embryo, embryonic development, uh, some genes are messing up, so therefore uh, there will be changes in the body shape and size. Like you do have the Sami twins when they grown together, or you have kids being born with like four or five nipples or uh, eight-legged uh, animals. So there is all these funky things and um, just very small changes in the activity of the control genes, and they can actually... Uh, produce very different animals. So this can happen that it could be important in macroevolution. 
and I just finished the, the whole chapter basically and this couple of slides I collected um, if you if you think that evolution is not true because you are a religious person it's not a problem and and you have to understand that much of the anxiety about evolution stems from the fear that if you accept the theory of evolution uh, that means that you deny the existence of God. In fact, evolutionary theory makes no demands about religious faith or lack of it. People who accept evolution are free to draw their own conclusion about higher power in the universe. So don't be scared just because you, you see that evolution is, 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 is a for sure thing. Uh, you can still believe in God just as well. So it's not a problem. And that's what I'm pointing out here, you guys, that... that uh, you cannot choose to believe in evolution or believe in God. You ha you can do both easily. And I have a couple of more sad slides here about this. Although some evolutionists, such as Richard Dawkins, are atheists, other evolutionists, such as Kenneth Miller, who is a biology professor at Brown University, uh, Francis Collins, and he is the head of National Human Genome, Genome uh, Institute. They see no conflict between evolutionary theory and religious belief. Um, there is a lot of actually uh, mainstream people who are important in the Protestant and Roman Catholic Church or Judaism or Islam who have no problem with evolution. So you would not be the only one actually. Um, Michael Zimmerman, evolutionary biologist and dean of College of Letters and Science at the University of Wisconsin, recently initiated a letter, and I kind of believe, I mean, understand it and accept it, so it's very important that you think about this. We, the undersigned Christian clergy from many different traditions, believe that the timeless truth of the Bible and the discoveries of modern science may comfort, comfortably coexist. Ooh, I cannot really say it really good. We believe that the theory of evolution is a foundational scientific truth, one that has stood up to re rigorous scrutiny and upon which much of the human knowledge and achievement rests. So it's important that without this evolutionary theory, you couldn't take pills when you're sick because evolution and medicine goes hand in hand so it's very important that you cannot reject this truth or treat it as one theory among others like just a theory it is deliberately embrace scientific ignorance and transmit such ignorance to our children so please 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 let your children to learn both it's very important that that you let them see the evolution because because if you don't then Basically, you close them out of the possibility to become scientists or, or understand the world around them. So it's very, very important that you are uh, going to allow them to learn about this. Scientists understand that there are some questions science simply cannot answer. Whether Genesis, as recorded in the King James Bible, describes the, a literal truth about the physical universe, is a testable hypothesis, hypothesis, and it turns out to be false. We know this form from dating of rocks and fossils, for one thing. But whether or not there is a God is not, not a testable hypothesis. That is a matter of personal belief, so you have to kind of understand that there is a difference. As Stephen J. Gould put it, science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. While evolution doesn't require a supreme being, it doesn't preclude the existence or involvement of such a being either. So these are very important things. So uh, please, please read them. Um, and uh, these are, um, it's very important for me that you go through these slides too and, and um, read them. Why isn't evolution called a law? Laws are generalization that describe phenomena, whereas theory explains phenomena. For example, the laws of thermodynamics describe what will happen under certain circumstances. Thermodynamics theories explain why these events occur. 
Laws like facts and theories can change with better data, but theories do not develop into laws <coughs> with the accumulation of evidence. Rather, theories are goal of science. I have all these questions in on the last couple of slides and I don't want to read them because look I made them really small but these these slides I found on the internet like which answers all those questions people usually have so just please please read them I will not ask it on the test but if you read these and you remember something you can actually write it down and I will give you extra credit for it so do please read them okay I hope you had uh, you enjoyed the evolution. I, I hope I put it together using other people's stuff where uh, you understand the most important concepts of it, okay? I'll see you.